This presentation examines the two-sample t-test for means, independent samples. So let's establish when it's fair to use this. The sets of data, as always, must come from a simple random sample. Otherwise, we cannot make inferences about the entire population from our sample. Also, the two sets must be independent. They cannot be related to each other, completely separated. And finally, either both data sets are large, i.e. more than 30, or both, both data sets come from an underlying normal distribution. So that's behaving like our central limit theorem rules. Now, there are some issues with this test. Most textbooks include a strategy when both sigma 1 and sigma 2 are known. Well, well this sort of is unrealistic because if we would know sigma 1 and sigma 2, by definition, we would have to know mu 1 and mu 2. So in the real world, this is not possible. Although in terms of developing the theory, that is an important model to look at. But we're not going to focus on it. Many texts include a model for situations when the variances are equal. They say when the variances are equal, we should pool the variances to somehow increase our degrees of freedom. Many statisticians have questioned whether this continues to be a valuable strategy. And I encourage you to look at the citation on the bottom of the slide to see some of the discussion on that. Uh, many texts do have a model for unequal variances, and we're going to follow something similar to, do, to that. Although they claim the degrees of freedom is the smaller of n1 minus 1 and n2 minus 1. Uh, this isn't really wrong, except it's not supported by statistical packages like Minitab. Minitab will use a different formula for computing the degrees of freedom, which will greatly increase that, which will indeed decrease our p-values and increase the likelihood of having statistical significance. So we're not going to use that model either. So unlike the other things we've looked at so far in this course, this is the first time where there is some dispute in terms of how best to run this procedure. So here's a test statistic we're going to use. Again, this is equivalent to the test statistic for models with unequal variances. x1 bar minus x2 bar minus mu1 minus mu2 over s1 squared over n1 plus s2 squared over n2. The only difference is mu1 minus mu2 is just about always going to be 0 because we're going to compare whether the first mean is larger than the second mean, whether the first mean is smaller than the second mean, or whether the first mean doesn't equal the second mean. And in each case, h0 would be mu1 equals mu2, or mu1 minus mu2 would be 0. So the test statistic that we will use in practicality is this one, just setting the mu1 minus mu2 equal to 0. So here's how we do the degrees of freedom. It is a somewhat complex formula, but try to stay with me. We're going to define A as S1 squared over N1, and we're going to define B as S2 squared over N2. So variance divided by the number, variance divided by the number. The degrees of freedom then will be A plus B squared divided by A squared over N1 minus 1 plus B squared over N2 minus 1. The degrees of freedom we will get will typically have a decimal in it, and we will just round down. So whatever degrees of freedom we get, we will round down before we determine our p-value. So here's an example. We have h0 mu1 equals mu2 versus h a mu1 is greater than mu2. So of course, if we use the other version, it would be mu1 minus mu2 equals 0 versus mu1 minus mu2 is greater than 0. So we're going to need to have some data. So here are some numbers that we have. We have to assume that these are simple random samples. Since both of these numbers are large, we're less concerned about normality. And we're going to go ahead and crunch the numbers. So we're going to need to find our test statistic, and we're going to need to find our degrees of freedom. So there's our numbers. There's our formula for the test statistic. x1 bar, 68.2, minus x2 bar, 63.2, divided by the square root of s1 squared, 13.7 squared over n1 over 35, plus s2 squared, 10 plus 4 squared over n2 over 41. And these are the numbers that we have. And for something like this, of course, it is simpler to do the computation using Excel. So you'll notice I have some headers as well as numbers inputted for n1, x1 bar, s1, n2, x2 bar, s2. Now we're going to write a line of code to compute t. So t is going to equal the difference of the two means. So that's x1 bar minus x2 bar divided by the square root of what? s1 squared over n1 
S1 squared over N1 plus S2 squared S2 squared over N2 and what does that give me? That gives me a T of 1.768. And it's hard to know whether 1.768 is an extreme T value or a non-extreme T value. So to answer that question, we're going to have to go ahead and get our degrees of freedom. So the first thing I need is I need A is S1 squared over N1 and B is S2 squared over N2. So coming back to Excel, defining A is going to equal S1 squared, S1 squared over N1. And defining B, that's going to equal S2 squared over N2. S2 squared over N2. And that now gives us A and B. So looking at our formula for the degrees of freedom, what do we have? We have A plus B squared all over A squared over N1 minus 1 plus B squared over N2 minus 1. So I'm going to go back to Excel and I'm going to compute A squared over N1 minus 1 and B squared over N2 minus 1. So you'll notice I have the headers here, A squared over N1 minus 1. So this will equal A squared a squared over n1 minus 1 n1 minus 1 and this next one is b squared over n2 minus 1 equals b squared over n2 minus 1 over n2 minus 1 and now we have those values as well now, looking at our formula, I need a plus b squared over a squared over n1 minus 1 plus b squared over n2 minus 1. So we have the two parts of the denominator in separate cells, and we will go ahead and write a program to get a plus b squared over the sum of those two. So to get degrees of freedom, it's going to equal a plus b squared equals parentheses a plus b squared divided the sum of those two a squared over n minus 1 plus b squared over n2 minus 1. And what does that give me for degrees of freedom? It gives me 62.76. We will always round down. So our df will equal 62. So we have the test statistic and we have the degrees of freedom. That's all we need to go ahead and compute the p-value. So H0 and HA, our test statistic T, and our degrees of freedom. Recognize this is a one-tailed test, so we're going to label our test statistic and shade to the right. T with 62 degrees of freedom, 1.768 is here. I want this area. That will be my p-value. I will ask many tabs CDF. 1.768 T with 62 degrees of freedom. And what does Minitab give us? It gives us 0.959, which means this area is almost 96% of the area under the curve. So if that's 0.959, almost 96%, how much is to the right? Just 0.041. So our p-value will be the area to the right. Our p-value will be 0.041. Okay. So there's our H0 and HA with our p-value. Since the p-value is small, we're going to reject H0. So therefore, we have sufficient evidence to conclude that the first sample does come from a population with a larger mean than does the second sample. And let's look at one more example. Here I have a two-tailed test. Mu1 equals Mu2 versus Mu1 does not equal Mu2. Notice what happens when I subtract Mu2 from both sides. And here are my statistics. All I'm going to say is this first sample has 26 items, so we must assume that this first sample comes from a normally distributed population. This is a fairly robust test, though, so if it's off a little bit, we're not going to be too concerned. But major outliers will indeed cause the test to be inappropriate. So there's our information. We want to go ahead and construct our test statistic T.
So we're going to have to plug those numbers in, and I can plug those numbers into the spreadsheet that I used before, and we can get our answers there. So N1 is 26. X1 bar is 82.6. S1 is 21.5. N2 is 33, X2 bar is 79.2, and S2 is 18.6. We do all that, we get a test statistic T of 0.64, we get degrees of freedom of 49.68, so if we round down we're going to say that our degrees of freedom will equal 49. So once we have the test statistic and the degrees of freedom, we can certainly find the p-value. This is a two-tailed test, so I have 0.64 on the right side, negative 0.64 on the left. The sum of the two areas will give us the p-value. I will ask many tabs CDF negative 0.64 with a T49, because it's a T49 distribution. And what's going to come back? 0.262. So this area is 0.262, and that area is 0.262. You add them together, we have a p-value that's ridiculously large. So it's indeed over 52%. So very, very large p-value. H0 and HA with a very large p-value. If the p-value is high, we have to fail to reject H0, which means we cannot throw this out, which means it's possible that that's still correct. We do not have sufficient evidence that the two samples come from populations with different means. There's a chance the two samples came from populations with exactly the same mean. And that will conclude this presentation.